Welcome to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, where we embark on a journey of personal growth, wellness, and empowerment. Join me, Stacey Chalemi, as we explore an insightful conversation with experts and thought leaders to uncover valuable tips and actionable insights that will elevate your life. From discussions on leadership and emotional intelligence to navigating midlife challenges and embrace personal transformation. This podcast is your go-to resource for inspiration and growth. So get ready to thrive, evolve, and unleash your true potential with me, your host, Stacey Chalemi. And today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. She has a podcast on our show and she is a and she works with integrative medicine and she has an amazing background. And today she's going to talk about menopause and the possible solutions for overcoming some of the symptoms that comes with menopause. And this is Victoria. And Victoria is going to tell you a little about herself. She has previous episodes. So please go on her podcast to see her episodes. And she's just amazing. So Victoria, it's so great to have you back on the show. Tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Hi, Stacey. Thank you again for having me. Uh, my name is Victoria Andarcia. I'm an integrative and functional medicine practitioner, and my practice is called Healthful Roots. And the basis of my company is that I work mostly with women, either on their fertility journey or women who are going through perimenopause and menopause and finding solutions that, you know, not only improve their quality of life, but their health span. And today uh, we wanted to touch on things that are common as we get older, and especially during perimenopause and menopause that you might not be aware of how exactly your hormones are affecting them, but that there are solutions. And then there are things that you can do to age gracefully and to be healthy for as long as possible. I think it's so important that people understand um, some of the symptoms and some of the things that go on with perimenopause. Because I, even myself, when I started to go through perimenopause, I didn't even know that I was going through it. All of a sudden, all these symptoms just came out from nowhere and I didn't know what was happening. And, you know, finally I went to a, um, a doctor, a functional medicine doctor, and they did a lot of blood work on me. And my testosterone was completely down to almost nothing. My progesterone was completely down to almost nothing. And with the help of a functional medicine doctor and going through hormone therapy and lots of other uh, different things that I did, they were able to balance my hormones. And I felt, I felt like I was 20 something else again, you know, it was like my, I just had so much energy. I was, my moods were, you know, balanced. I was more focused. I had clarity. I was just, you know, it was just a total turnaround in my health. So I think it's so important, you know, because a lot of times, you know, women are going through so many different changes, you know, um, you know, you, it's, you're starting to gain weight, you know, a lot of times you experience, you know, um, muscle loss where, you know, all of a sudden you're looking in the mirror and you can go like this, you know, it's like, where did the muscle go, you know, and even people, you know, they experience osteoporosis. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's so, um, you know, it's, it's such a challenging time in a woman's life, you know, and even men, they go through it also, you know, in different ways, but, you know, for a woman, it's, really hard. And, you know, I know that you have some great information today. So I'd like you really to share it with everybody because, you know, menopause is a, is a huge deal. And a lot of people just settle to do nothing and just, you know, just deal with it. And, you know, there are lots of options out there and they shouldn't have to suffer and, and experience these symptoms. And, you know, and some people don't even know where to start. And that's the problem too, is like, where do I begin? Who do I go to? How do I get help? You know, what's going on? There's so many things to talk about today. So I just love to hear what you have to say. Well, exactly that, right? This is about like empowering people to know, uh, you know, what to do and what to look for. And, you know, you mentioned osteoporosis and, you know, that's one of the things that we've accepted as something that just happens with age. However, you know, Osteoporosis is weakening of the bones. And what people don't realize is that if you're older than 65 and you fall, you have a hip fracture. One in three adults over the age of 65 after that hip fracture will be dead within 12 months. Yeah. Really? Pretty, the, like the numbers are pretty high. And then also you factor in that how your life changes after that. So we call it morbidity. And a lot of people will... Um, so I don't have the stats on that, but a lot of people end up having like loss of mobility and independence, you know, and a lot, half of the people will not be able to get back to their pre-fracture strength. Yeah. Right? So then you think, okay, well, if I'm over 65 and I have a hip fracture, you know, 
I can potentially lose my independence, which is a huge thing. And, or if I have a lot of other conditions, I can possibly, you know, pass away from this injury. But then when you look at when insurance starts to cover, in most cases, the um, DEXA scan, the DEXA scan is how you look at bone. It's yeah. at the age of 65 or above, but it's too late then, right? Mm -hmm. So then what are risk factors? You have to know what are your risk factors for osteoporosis? So one of them is like petite frame. So people who are just generally petite, uh, smoking, excessive alcohol use, family history. So if you have a family history, um, then that will go up. If you have been taking a lot of steroids, like if you have an autoimmune disease, or for example, if you have COPD and you, you know your doctor has been prescribing prednisone or methylprednisolone just for your flares, that can definitely increase your risk. Um, yeah, so those are the risk factors. So if you go to your doctor and you say, hey, like I have these risk factors, I need to be screened for osteoporosis, then what can you do? There, there are a lot of studies and a lot of evidence that strength training also strengthens your bones, right? So being proactive, you don't have to wait until you're 65 to like, oh, what am I going to do? You start now, like the things that you do early on are what are going to contribute to being healthier later on. So strength training, but then also hormones, right? One of the things uh, that estrogen helps us do is to keep our bones strong. And as we get older, we lose that estrogen. So we do lose the bone strength and the ability to regenerate bone. And they have shown that women who do start hormone replacement therapy can maintain their bone strength longer than if they didn't, right? And then if you add like testosterone as well, testosterone uh, works with the estrogen to keep your bones strong. But do you want to do that when you already figured out that you have osteoporosis or do you want to do that ahead of time? Exactly. Right. Because the pharmaceuticals that we have now to treat osteoporosis don't really work as well as lifestyle and hormone replacement. And they have a lot of side effects. Yes, definitely. A hundred percent. I, I, you know, I think that's the one, the greatest thing about functional medicine and integrative medicine is that they focus on trying to find the problem before it occurs. And I think it's so important for people to not wait till it happens, but to really, you know, keep track of how your health is. And then, you know, if, if things are starting to slide and you usually can figure that out when people, when doctors have, you know, look at your blood work and they see elevations in certain areas or they see declines in certain areas, they can tell, you know, what the possibilities that can occur in the future if your, your levels are still going like this. And that's when we can, you know, doctors and, and, and people in the medical field can like jump in and help and, and try to prevent these things before it's too late. Exactly. Because I think that one of the things that we do is that it's a lot harder in traditional medicine to correct something if it's already too late, right? And then I don't think that, at least I didn't learn about this in medical school, was talking about like supplementation, you know, are you getting enough vitamin D? Are you getting enough calcium in your diet? Vitamin D, a lot of doctors don't even check that, you know, because a lot of times insurance won't cover it as a preventative thing. But mm -hmm. like vitamin D is so important, not only for your bone strength, but for your immunity, for cognitive health, for so many other things. So you know, in, in that setting, it's, and I think you've mentioned it, you know, when we've had other discussions is um, screening for nutrient deficiencies mm -hmm. and how much better you can feel when you address those nutrient deficiencies. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it's amazing. But when I, when I had the blood work done and they, they were screening me for vitamins and they were screening me for nutrient deficiencies. It was like, there were certain areas that were low and it was like, okay, you should be doing this. You should be doing this. You should be taking this. And, and once I did that, it was just, um, just a huge difference in my energy level and the way I felt, you know, it wasn't fatigue anymore because there was a point where I didn't even want to roll out of bed, you know, because I was so fatigued, you know, I had chronic fatigue because I was going through hormonal changes and it played a big role in my overall health. Health. Yeah. And, you know, one of the, the good things about the DEXA scan, if you pay for it out of pocket, you can find places where you can get it for $200 and $300, which is expensive if your insurance is not going to cover it. But I think it's better than like not having it at all. But the DEXA scan 
has the ability not only to look at your bone strength, but it can also tell us about um, visceral fat, which we'll get into how much visceral fat you have. But then it can also talk, like show you uh, muscle, like how much muscle does your body have? Because these are other things that change as you go into menopause. So for $200, $300, you're getting a lot of information on things that are really important to look at, right? Because, uh, you know, we have two types of fat. You have the subcutaneous fat, which is a fat that you just like pinch. And then you have a visceral fat, which you can't really see, but that's the one that collects around your organs and the one that's very inflammatory and harmful for your health. And yes. as your hormones change, especially in that, you know, menopausal phase, you can collect more visceral fat, right? Yeah. Which this low level inflammation is going to cause, you know, joint pain can cause neuroinflammation. Uh, it can increase your risk of coronary artery disease. So you right. want to look at that. And, um, so that's another area where hormone replacement can come in, but also changing your diet, right? Like a lot of people don't realize that during perimenopause and menopause, the way you eat needs to change as well. So mm -hmm. um, that's something that you can see on the DEXA scan, which is really important. And then, you know, the, the term for muscle loss later is called like sarcopenia. So loss of muscle, which I mean, aside from the DEXA, I know some gyms have um, those in body scans where you can have a look at your muscle composition. But it was at the age of 30, and then every decade after, you're losing three to 5% of muscle. Right. And I mean, if you're at 30, and you like really never worked out, and you're like starting with not a lot, and that like that yeah. adds by the time that you get to like 50 or 60. Yeah. Right? And muscle is important, not only for your metabolism, because it speeds up your metabolism, the more muscle you have, but for mm -hmm. bone strength, you need muscle yes. for bone strength. Yes. Uh, so that's my, my thing on the DEXA, you know, it's, it's beneficial for various reasons. Oh, I agree a hundred percent. I think it's so important to know these things. And one important thing that you said, you know, you talked about nutrition and, you know, so many people are interested in how should I eat? You know, how is that, you know, going to make a big impact? You know, can I actually, you know, change my diet and, and is it going to make a big impact in the way I feel for women who are going through menopause? What are some of the things that you suggest that maybe the, the, the things they, they do eat and the things they should avoid? Well, the things that we should eat. Um, I saw this reel on Instagram a couple of weeks ago and I was like, I didn't realize how much of my adult life I was going to spend thinking about how much protein I'm eating. Right. Yeah. Like, yes. Because it's a hard thing, right? Like if you look at it's uh one milligram per, um, kilogram of body weight or one gram, one gram per kilogram of body weight is what you want right. for uh, protein. Um, and that's a lot of protein, especially if you're like someone who just like grabs a yogurt in the morning and just heads out, right. You really yeah. want to focus on protein intake because that's going to be one, it keeps you full longer. So it's better for not eating junk and snacking, but it's yeah. good for muscle strength. But the other one is fiber, right? Like fiber is really, really important, especially when you're going through these changes, everyone is going to have different hormone fluctuations. I have women who, you know, are low on estrogen, but like during perimenopause, there are some women who will have like spikes of estrogen. And like, these are the women who are getting like really heavy cycles, um, really bad cramping. Like yeah. when you're having a high fiber diet, it actually helps absorb like some of the waste products of like hormones in your gut and then help you release it. So Fiber is really important. And then my, worrying about and maintaining like a diet and healthy fats, mm -hmm. cutting out junk food, cutting out alcohol. Alcohol is a huge one. One, it prevents you from burning fat. I think it's yeah. like 72 hours after, you know, you've had alcohol, it prevents you from burning fat. Then let's just not even get into how much it affects your sleep. Yeah. You know, and then if you're not sleeping well, that leads to other health problems. So I'm not saying like, don't drink at all, but definitely be mindful. And then yeah. you know, so people say, if you're going to drink, like don't drink, like right before bed, try to do it a little bit earlier, maybe when you get home from work, because this effect on sleep is really, really uh, pronounced. And then the wow. last one, which might not be super obvious, but I'm going to say is caffeine. I think that we overdo it a lot with a caffeine and yeah. in that phase of perimenopause and menopause, I find that they are the most stressed, right? Like their kids are either like still in school or going to school or they're yeah. having some other life thing happening with their yeah. own hormonal changes. And yes. then, 
you have to look at how stress is also going to impact these hormone levels. And right. then if you're constantly like drinking caffeine throughout the day, it actually makes you more tired. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. It's so true. Yeah. That was one of the things my, my doctor had mentioned to me. He's like, all right, I want you to cut out the caffeine. I want you to cut out the alcohol because it cuts off the oxygen. He said also down below. So when you're taking, you know, when you're drinking large um, consumptions of alcohol or, you know, or um, caffeine, you're really, you're cutting out some of the oxygen, you know, and it's, it's affecting you down below. So if you have problems down below where you're getting that cramp in and you're getting, you know, you're getting pain and your experience and, you know, dryness and stuff like that, or overactive bladder, it's just, it's just adding to it. It's just instigating it to become even worse, you know? So, you know, that was one of the things that I, you know, you know, I, I was told and what's your intake on that? Well, if you look at the, like that cramping part and how it makes it worse, I can definitely see that with the alcohol. If your liver is prioritizing having to detoxify from alcohol, you're not mm -hmm. going to be detoxifying from hormones in the liver. Yes. So that's definitely going to make, uh, like cramping worse. Um, right. I heard about coffee making, um, like if you have like an overactive bladder or like, I've heard of that, if it's excessive, making that worse yeah. as well. Um, mm -hmm. so I definitely think that in that way too, uh, it could definitely impact. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize that because a lot of people, you know, as they get older, they go out, they have dinner, they have alcohol, you know, and the alcohol consumption sometimes increases as you get older for, for some people. And, you know, these are things that I think play a huge role. In, and especially when you're eating, you know, really figuring out the right foods. I know that when I incorporated more vegetables into my diet, I actually felt a lot better. It was that all that fiber and the, some of the proteins in the, in the vegetables that made me feel so much better, you know? So I made it a, an, an effort to eat more vegetables in my, in my daily consumption and my daily diet. And that well, seemed to help a lot. And I would even say like anybody listening just to try it, right? Like even in early in the morning, like just try having protein, like eggs with either mushrooms or something like filling. You don't, yeah. I don't, when I eat those big meals, which are healthy and they're not like, you know, super high in calories, but just like high yeah. in nutrition, I don't snack really. I can wait until right. my next meal, but if I just like grab a croissant, you know, yeah. like, like two hours later, I'm like, oh man, like, what am I going to eat now? You know, yeah. so it really makes a difference. I agree with you completely. When I eat certain foods, I stay fuller for a longer period of time. I tend to, you know, and you could have more of those foods too. You know, if, if you're eating healthy foods, you're eating the right foods, you could actually eat a little bit more and it's not going to affect you because like, I think weight gain is something you hear a lot of women complain about too, is that, you know, they're, they're, they're looking in the mirror. And I, I had this problem too, is like one day I looked in the mirror and, and I was like, where did all this extra, you know, fat come from on I mean, my hips, you know, it was like, you know, my hips, my stomach, I was like, oh my God, you know, it's like, uh, and I hear women all the time, you know, that, you know, certain, they gain weight or the weight, you know, goes to certain areas. You hear a lot of women complaining about their hips, you know, and about their stomach, gain weight on their stomach. It's stuff like that. Is there anything women can do to help them with that weight gain during the times of perimenopause or menopause? Yeah. So I think it's one, like understanding, like what's happening, right? You're naturally losing muscle, right? So if you're putting on muscle, it's going to help speed up your metabolism. Um, so definitely focusing on strength training. Uh, you know, I love like high intensity workout classes, but they're not the best for you because they're actually putting your body into more stress and you're not building as much muscle as if you just focus on strength training. So focusing on that is important, but then also understanding that with this lowering of estrogen, you're also becoming more insulin resistant. That's why like I'll have women who are like 55, for example, where like I've never had high cholesterol, right? And like now like my sugar's high and I've never had high sugar. So with that decrease in estrogen, you're becoming more insulin resistant. Uh, and then, you know, if you have high insulin for a long amount of time, that's what causes diabetes. But my point in bringing that up is just like understanding that that's why you're getting, you're gaining the fat, right? Yeah. You're becoming more insulin resistant with that loss of estrogen. So then it's just like, yes, how am I going to change my diet? Intermittent fasting can be great, but it's not for everybody. For yes. people who are super stressed out and tired all the time, do not do intermittent fasting because it's going to put more stress on your body. So then I would say focusing on the protein and getting the fiber at every meal, incorporating the strength training. But then I find also, um, sometimes people are just like, I'm only gaining weight in my tummy, right? My stomach area. 
And then when I do like cortisol tests to see, like these people have really high cortisol levels, which is like a stress hormone, right? Which was necessary. We need it. But if it's right. high for a long amount of time, your sugar levels go up. It is also going to affect your, um, yeah, your sugar and your cholesterol, but then it's going to bring down the sex hormones even more. Yeah. So then it's finding ways to manage stress. And for some people it can be different and it changes. I used to love meditation. I can't meditate anymore. So I go to yoga, you know, yeah. and it's finding like the thing that is going to help you bring down your stress, especially during that time. Uh, right. And for some women, I, cause I've had it happen who are perimenopausal, who start gaining that weight is telling them work out less right? Because yeah. you're working out like six, seven days a week. That's not good either. Yeah. It can be as simple as like starting them on progesterone, right? right? And their body starts to like recalibrate. And then like that weight will start coming off because some women have good habits already. Some people are already doing the exercise and they're already eating healthy, but, and they're still gaining the weight. Then it's just like, okay, is it stress, you know, or is it hormonal? Let's like have a look at what's going on. Right. Exactly. And that was like an issue for me too. It was like, I, my class, my cortisol level was always normal. And then, and, and then all of a sudden out of the blue, it started to spike and it was so hard to get that cortisol level back to normal. You know, I know there's a lot of women out there that, that suffer from a high cortisol level, you know, especially when they're going through menopause, is there like some things, you know, so is strength training is really good for the cortisol yoga. And if you can do meditation, it's good. Are there some other things people can do to try to get that yeah. cortisol level down so okay so i would say it's like an instagram trend but it's true um having yeah. coffee on a empty stomach is definitely not good because you're every time that you have caffeine energy drink whatever you're spiking your cortisol level right, right. So eat first or have tea and then have your coffee is important to like not to overstimulate yourself and i find that um, cause I've done it. I went three weeks without drinking coffee. And then I found that I didn't really need it. I was craving yeah. taste. So then I was like, started to drink decaf cause I was having issues with the cortisol thing, but yeah. okay, so then it's that. And then it's also like listening to your body. I used to be so rigid. And a lot of my patients are like that, where I'd be like, I'm gonna work out five times a week and I'm going to do this. And then sometimes I just wake up and I'm like, I was supposed to go to the gym today, but I feel like doing yoga, right? Like yeah. learning to like, listen to your body because right. I think that you just like get stuck on a schedule and then we are so inflexible we can't go back um yes. so doing that uh breath work helps yoga helps uh meditation can be helpful and then i there's this um it's open house is a podcast but she also has like this program where you do like somatic practices so mm -hmm. it's just like it's pilates but with your breath work or she'll do um like shaking, right? Like just there's, yeah. there's so many different things that you can do. You just have to find like what your thing is. Yeah. Or I think that's, yeah. And a bath is, you know, I, I tell people that all the time, you know, maybe a bath with a little Epsom salts that, you know, with lavender scent or something like that can like relax somebody, you know, if you could take 10, 15 minutes out, you know, maybe at night before you go to bed and just like relax in a bath, it, it could be so beneficial, I think. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, to people feel selfish because they're like, oh, like I have kids and I have to like do this. Um, but you really have to take like whatever, you know, not the whole day, but like take some time in the day, 20 minutes just to like be with yourself. Right. I yeah. think it's really important to keep your sanity um, because that cortisol piece is like um, super important and it can also affect your mental health and your mood, mm -hmm. which is oh. a big thing that happens during perimenopause and menopause. I'll have women who are like, oh my God, my kid is like really irritating me right now. And I know it's not his fault. Like I hear that a lot yeah, and then yeah. you're like, okay, so like you do the testing and you're okay. You're a little like out of balance and then you have, to, I can give you progesterone or whatever it is, but how are you going to take care of yourself? Right. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's so important because, you know, a lot of people have that guilt or they feel shameful because they feel like, you know, it, you know, they put their, their kids first or they put their, you know, spouse or partner first. And, and it's like, you know, and they're always the last one. And, you know, people have to realize they can't, unless you take care of yourself, you barely can't take care of others as well. You know, I think that's something that people have to recognize too. What do you think? No, I a hundred percent agree with you. And it's something that I talk to them about and it's, it can be 10 minutes, but it has to be, um, it has to be something, you know, and especially, um, you know, one of the other things that I wanted to talk about was like 
heart health as you get older, yeah. stress can impact also your heart health. And mm -hmm. uh, it's really important just to like try to manage that. And it's easier said than done. And some people need to speak to like a, you know, a therapist or just someone who can help like guide them through those tough moments. Uh, but yeah. when it comes to heart health, heart disease is like the number one killer in women, but that number doubles when they've reached menopause already, right? Yeah. Because estrogen is protective. Estrogen is protective for men and women, but women have more estrogen and it keeps your like blood vessels, um, pliable and healthy. And then when you start to lose that, then you can start building up plaque more easily. And you have to consider what um, risk factors, right? Like, did you smoke your family history of heart disease? Uh, have you had diabetes or high blood pressure or high cholesterol, like throughout your life, you got to consider that. So yeah. one of the tests that I think is you know, not something that you wait until something happens to get, but something that you can do in your forties would be the coronary calcium score test. Have you heard of that one? No, I haven't. Mm -hmm. So it's a CT scan and it looks at uh, plaque in the heart, right? It looks, it can see heart and plaque. And so okay. basically that it gives you like a score. And if you score really high, then you're like, wow, okay. Like I have a really high risk of having a cardiac event, or if it's low, then, you know, like you're doing things right. And you just continue on that path. Um, but that's like a good non-invasive way to know rather than waiting, especially if you have a family history of heart disease. Um, I know a lot of times you see like um, uh, older people go for a test like that to, and then some of them, you know, if they do have a lot of plaque, they end up getting stents put, put in them and stuff like that. But it's, pr it's probably better to go for these tests prior before you get to that point, because I think it's 70 percent, you know, um, before you, know, you could have a certain amount of plaque in your, in your body. And then it's, it, it's, you hit that danger zone pretty much. Right. No, that that's very true. And like, for example, in my, like my brother, we have a family history of um, heart disease it tends to affect the men. I think at 30, I had him do that test. Okay. Like, do we have anything to worry about now? Okay. We'll probably do it again at 40. And then you can kind of just like keep track and see yeah. what style things do we have to adjust? You know, like, are you eating too many burgers and fries? Because for him, it can be the case, um, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, or like, what do we have to change? But uh, I just think that that's a good uh, test and it's not expensive. Like I've had people pay for it out of pocket and you can get it done anywhere from like 75 to a hundred dollars. Right. Um, so I think that that's, um, just something to keep in mind because women do have a risk of heart disease that increases, especially during menopause. So I, again, just keeping um, track of your, your plaque level and also by choosing the right foods, food plays a big part of it too. If you eat healthy foods, you know, you won't have a buildup of plaque, you know, so rapidly, you know, as you get older, it seems like, you know, even, even if it runs in the family, you could probably, you know, prevent it or slow it down by the, the foods that you choose as well. Yeah, absolutely. You can mitigate your risk. And that's something that I've seen, like when I've worked in the hospital that people will be like, oh, I'm diabetic and I have a family history of diabetes. Not like, not necessarily. No, it's just like habits are also passed down. Right. Yeah. I think yeah. it's about that. And I've seen people who have a very strong history of heart disease who then get to 80 and nothing happened because they were conscious of that and they decided that they were going to eat healthy and exercise and all those other right. factors. So I think that that's also important because I have seen people just say like, well, it runs in the family. It is what it is, but it's, it's not the case. Yeah. And that's something I've heard so many times and it, and it kind of annoys me because it's like, you know, it's, it's, you know, yes, you might have it in your family, but you know, by the way, by changing the way you live and by changing certain things, you actually could prevent it or improve your condition. And people, sometimes they think, okay, okay. It runs in my family. There's nothing I can do, you know? And it's like, it, there's so much you could do. And I think that that's like, one of the reasons I went into functional medicine is like, I was just so frustrated to see that things were preventable, but I don't know that like people feel empowered to do so, or they don't even know that they can. And yeah. I, I really find that very frustrating when people are just like, well, you know, because uh, your life could be so much better. You can be so much healthier if you just knew what you had to do to do it. 
I find sometimes too, is that when you talk to primary doctors, they frown upon fun functional medicine because they weren't taught it in, co in yeah. medical school. And because they weren't taught it, they, they don't understand it or they don't have enough information about it that they could support it or recommend it unless you've gone, you know, unless you, you studied it and you understand the importance of functional medicine integrated with, with, with regular medicine, you know, and medical. And it, a lot of people just, sometimes I think people fear what they don't know. But, you know, functional medicine changed my life. I, I did a total turnaround. It, it helped me improve my health and my overall well-being completely. Yeah. And, you know, I have, uh, again, like people who come to me and I, as like their last resort, who've been dealing with stuff for years and nobody talked to them about uh, food triggers, changing their diet. And then you yeah. just do those things, address like nutrient deficiencies. And then they're like, wow, like I haven't been able to mow my lawn for years because yeah. I was scared that I was going to pass out or something. And you're just right. like, really, we just changed your diet. Like I didn't do anything crazy. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I, I don't think people realize how easy it could be, you know, how you could just by making certain tweaks in your, your lifestyle, you know, you can, you can change your overall well being. And, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's so important that we get this message across to people because, and, and I think a lot of people are just like, they just don't know where to go. They just don't know where to start. I think that's one of the problems too. Yeah. And we're, we're talking about lifestyle. So the last one that I wanted to bring up because it's super important is dementia, right? Alzheimer's. So mm -hmm. women are times more likely than men uh, to have Alzheimer's. And yes. there's a doctor called Dr. Lisa Moscone, and she wrote The Menopause Brain, uh, mm -hmm. which is a great book for anyone who wants to read it. But she talks about how these changes, and it's not just the changes that happen during perimenopause, but anytime a woman goes through like drastic uh, hormone changes. So for example, like childbirth, like those just big fluctuations in hormones, um, they start to, they can affect your cognition. Right. And, um, they're thinking that that's one of the reasons why women are at increased risk of, uh, Alzheimer's than men. And then you add in, if you're diabetic, if you have high blood pressure, all those things that they on top of the fact that we're going to go through menopause and already at increased risk, then yeah. those things will significantly impact your risk as well. So that's why it's so important for um, the lifestyle that we've been talking about, because we want to decrease our risk of these, well, of dementia, like that would be awful, right? Um, uh -huh. So that one is a really important one, because it also comes down to like how you're eating, how you're moving, uh, and how you're dealing with things in your life, right? How you're dealing with stress. What are some of the things people can do to help prevent the possibilities of dementia or Alzheimer's occurring in their, in their, uh, in their life? So, I mean, you can do gen like the APO gene testing to see if you have the gene that increases your risk. Um, because I think that sometimes if you see that, then you're more likely to make changes that you need to make. But yeah. again, it just goes back to uh, what you're eating, right? Um, alcohol. I think it's also one of the things that I focus a lot of my practice is um, toxins, right? Like what toxins are you being exposed to and how are you detoxing from these yeah. right? it could be like environmental or maybe you just like genetically are not someone who can like detox properly. How do you enhance those detox pathways? And then if you are diabetic or you do have high blood pressure, um, you know, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to mitigate that? Because uh, one of the things that people, because you can't feel blood pressure, you can't feel it right. unless you're high and you have a headache is that people don't realize that you can be getting like little strokes, um, like throughout your life. And yeah. so like, right. microvascular changes and what is, it shows up as on the, uh, scan on an MRI. And that over time is going to increase your risk of, um, dementia. It's like, I think number two, vascular dementia is what they call it. Um, right. so really important not just to be like oh I have high blood pressure or whatever like what are your risk factors and how do we mitigate those um, right. I think it's important and then they they have not um said like oh use hormone replacement for prevention of dementia like that's not on the table yet um, right like, knowing what I know uh, I would definitely want to one keep my hormones healthy as long as I can yeah and just based off of all the things that we talked about I would start hormone replacement as soon as you know I could right
Exactly. I, you know, I, I, I'm all for it. I, like I said, I've seen a huge difference and I, I feel younger. I, you know, I, I re I have, you know, I have the energy and, and so many different things, you know, and, and I think for women too, their menstruation, you know, that was a, a big factor also is that I was bleeding for, for two weeks and I was bleeding heavily and I didn't understand what was happening. And that was in the beginning before I was put on hormone therapy. And then once I was put on hormone therapy, my, you know, these abnormal periods where they were coming, they weren't even coming on a 28 day basis. All of a sudden they started, you know, coming on a 28 day basis. The blood flow was really low and it wasn't, you know, heavy. And I was having a normal cycle where it was last in the appropriate amount of days and, and not this crazy, like two week span where you're just like dragging your feet and you don't understand why you're going through this. And, you know, these are, and the fatigue too, you know, these are all factors that, you know, people should address and they shouldn't, they shouldn't just accept and say, oh, I'm getting older. This is what happens. Yeah, because it doesn't have to be that way. And if you had gone to a different doctor, they probably would have recommended birth control. Yes. And that's happened to me too. And I get annoyed. I'm like, no, I don't want to go on birth control. I am 52 years old. I don't need to go on birth control, you know? And they said, I, you know, I, I've, I've come into like a, a GYN's office for certain things. And that's the first thing they say. And then they'll say, you know, well, how about a partial hysterectomy or a hysterectomy? And I'm like, that's the same look I, I, I gave them. I was like, this is ridiculous, you know? And then it was like, you know, and then when I went to see a functional medicine doctor, they ju he just shook his head and he was like, what an idiot, you know, and it was just, like, you know, and just by making certain changes and, and using hormone therapy and by, you know, just doing different things, you know, they were able to get rid of all the problems that I was having. And, you know, cause people don't realize that, you know, you hear birth control, there's so many side effects with birth control and it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't really help. It might mask a couple of symptoms, but it's not helping the situation. And then, you know, if you do get a partial hysterectomy or you get a hysterectomy, you're going right into post-menopause and that's a whole different area that we haven't even touched base on, but that, that, you know, that makes you feel a lot older and your body's not functioning the way it used to. So so it's like, yeah, even if you keep your ovaries. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And I don't think people are aware of that, you know, and they hear their doctors say that and they're like, oh, I don't have to get my period. Oh, wonderful. You know, and they don't realize the consequences that it's bringing as well. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, one of the things and one of the books, uh, the new menopause and Dr. Aviva Ram, who I follow, uh, half of these procedures that surgical procedures that we're doing on, on women are unnecessary. Like these hysterectomies yeah. we're offering, like you just start a hormone replacement and it got better. If you start someone on uh, birth control at 50, because they're having heavy periods, what you're doing is that you're shutting down their body's ability to make their own hormones. And that's why the periods get better, right? Because right. you're not fixing the problem. You just like stopped the body from doing what it was like trying to do. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And then you also, a lot of women experience weight gain also when that happens too. So it's, it's, it's not helping the situation. So I always would get annoyed when, you know, doctors, you know, would, would offer that. And I feel like certain, you know, certain types of doctors just look in a triangle and they only have like certain options they could offer. That's why it's so good to go to like a functional medicine doctor or a doctor who believes in integrative medicine because they look at things from a totally different perspective because you know it, it's not just three options, you know, that you know there's more ways to help your body and and those to me, you know, a lot of times are unnecessary. They do those procedures and you know a, a woman didn't have to go through that, you know. No. No, and and the good I mean I the way I practice is sometimes patients will come with Oh, like, what do you think about this? Okay. So we look at it. Like, can this help you? Yeah. Okay. Like we work together to determine because, you know, like I mentioned, not everyone's going to be comfortable with hormone replacement. Okay. So what can we do that's going to positively impact your hormones? And I've had women who don't want to be on um, hormone replacement, but we just change certain lifestyle things that we know that they're struggling with. We maybe add some things to their diet that can kind of help regulate their hormones and they yeah. feel better. Right. right? Because I think sometimes too, people are like, oh, you don't want the birth control. You don't want the hysterectomy. Well, okay, sorry. I can't offer you anything else, but like, no, you got to work together to find a solution. Yes. And I, I found that a lot of doctors, they, they do exactly that. They just offer a couple of solutions and, and that's it. 
you know, and, and then, you know, people are like, well, that's what my GYN said, you know, and, and they're like, you know, and they're, they're just, you know, because the doctor said that, you know, I always encourage people go for a second or a third opinion and, and, you know, and you, and go see different doctors, you know, and, and some people I've talked to people, they don't even know what a functional medicine doctor is. So it really, you know, it, it's so important that people understand that there are more options and there are more doctors out there that can help on a more natural basis and really get your body to feel back to its its normal healthy self yeah and even if it's not a functional medicine doctor there are some um traditional chinese medicine practitioners mm -hmm. that work with women and their hormones and i've had friends who go either for fertility or they're going because they have really heavy periods and just like doing the herbs and the acupuncture can help like there are so many modalities out there you just have yeah. to be open one and like look for for different ways to handle things hundred percent. I agree with you. Now, if you had to look at today's conversation and you really want to emphasize on some important factors, what are some of the things you'd like to emphasize to our listeners? Well, so we talked about osteoporosis, uh, coronary artery disease and heart disease about the visceral fat, which bothers a lot of people and the muscle loss and dementia. So the main thing with all of these is that these are risks that increase as we get older and especially perimenopause and postmenopausal, but there are lifestyle factors that we can use to decrease, mitigate this from happening. But then it's also understanding that what we did in our twenties is not going to work for us in our forties. And you have to be okay with like changing how you work out, changing how you eat, but then it's also the prevention, right? Like if you know that you already have risk factors and you're 35, what can you do to like mitigate those risks? Can you, right. you can get rid of like type two diabetes. If you're on insulin for diabetes, you don't always have to be on insulin for diabetes. So exactly. what do you do? And then what tests can you do, right? To kind of see where you're at. So the DEXA scan, don't wait until 65. I think that's way too late. Right. If you have a family history of coronary artery disease, get a CT calcium score test and see where am I in the list of risk factors. It's just about being proactive and understanding yeah. that these things are common but it doesn't have to be normal. Exactly. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Now tell me some of the services that you provide. Okay. So, uh, I do telehealth and my s services come in like packages. So I do like three month packages to start because obviously like this is lifestyle stuff and it's not going to happen in one visit. And mm -hmm. then after that, you have the option to sign up for the rest of the year, but we do functional medicine testing through like blood work. I do like salivary cortisol tests, GI map. We look at everything depending on what you come with. And when we work together, we're meeting monthly. So we'll have our first appointment. We kind of just look at everything. What tests do we need to order? or What do we need to do? And then from there, we kind of just slowly start making our way through. Okay. Is it life? We start with lifestyle. Okay, now we have to address the hormones. Let's address the hormones. We have to address this. It's just kind of a stepwise process. And that's why like the minimum is three months because that's around the time that it takes for people to start being like, wow, yeah, this works. Yeah, exactly. I love it because I, I think it's so important to people to look into it. Now, do you have a newsletter or anything they can sign up for? Yes, actually. Um, it is in like my, my link tree on Instagram. So I have an Instagram, I'm very active on that. Um, but I do have a newsletter that I send every Monday or every other Monday when I have a podcast come out. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be there. And then I do offer a lot of free webinars. Uh, so if people just follow me on Instagram, they'll see when they're happening. And they're from anywhere from fertility to like perimenopause and menopause and hormone replacement. I've done some on weight loss. Uh, so if people just want to um, follow me, at, it's at Healthful Roots MD. Uh, you can just see what's happening there because there's usually something going on. Oh, I love it. And also where can people find you on your website? So the website is um, www.healthfulrootsmd.com. I love it. This has been amazing. I, you know, before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, say to the audience before we go? Um, Cause this is, you know, something I think is so important for, for people. They, you know, there's always so many questions. And I know one common question is, um, you know that I get a lot from people is that their, their libido drops during menopause. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's like a big factor, I think, in, in a lot of women. And is there anything that you'd like to, you know, maybe um, suggest or, you know, any advice you'd like to give about, you know, your libido drop in and, and their urge to want to have intercourse is, is not there like it used to be? 
Yeah. So that's a common one and it's complex. Um, so I'll say, <laughs> I'll start with, I do offer free 15 minute consults. So for anybody who wants to just like sign up on my Instagram, I have it there, but uh, right. that one is complicated because it can be like, are you having pain or discomfort with sex? Nobody's going to want to have sex if it's painful. So yes. in that case, just doing like vaginal, um, so like the vaginal suppositories, or you can even do a ring DHEA intravaginally is also helpful if the estrogen hasn't worked for you. So I would say that's one thing that you have to address. Then the second thing is, you know, if your testosterone is really low or your hormones are really low in general, that's kind of kill desire, yeah. uh, especially if cortisol is involved. I've seen if you're very stressed out, um, mm -hmm. you're not going to want to have sex. Right? right. Like I have women who are like, they don't even want to go to the gym anymore. And then I'm like, what, what makes you think you want to have sex if you don't even want to go to the gym? You know? So it's like, how do we get you out of that slump? And it could be yeah. like hormones or just like lifestyle changes to kind of get you um, not feeling so tired. But I do think that one of the things that we kind of neglect is connection with your partner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one that like, you know, you have to, people just think like, oh, I want to have sex. So I'm going to, why can't I do it? But it's also like, are you connected to your partner or is there a disconnect there? Because um, I think that's an uncommon one that we don't talk about. So then it kind of just depends on which one is going on. Because if you're right. like, oh, I have dryness and it hurts, that is so easy. Let's go like yeah. vaginal estrogen, let's all the way. Um, but then if it's one of the other two, then it's just going to take a little bit, a little longer to kind of get things in balance. And you can use hormones. I've used peptides. There are um, Mm -hmm. So if it's, I don't, have you heard of peptides like sermorelin and yes. PT-141? So mm -hmm. um, that can kind of help with libido a little bit as well. So right. there's so many things that you can try, but at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to like, what is the root cause and um, just what are you willing to try? Right. Exactly. I love it. I love it. You know, that I, I think this has been an amazing session. You know, I think you gave a lot of great information and a lot of great advice. These are all, all common factors, you know, things in, in, in women's lives that we all experience at some point. And it's so important that people understand that there's more than one solution out there and that, you know, going to a functional medicine doctor or looking for other options is the way to go. You know, don't just listen to what one person says. If, it, if it's, you know, if it's not what what you, you, you think is going to be good for you, or it's not working, you know, open yourself up to other options. And I'm a, a big believer in functional medicine and integrative medicine. So I really love what you're doing. And I, you know, I thank you so much for coming on the show today. You've been amazing. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed uh, our chat today. Me too. And I look forward to our future chats. You have a great day. Thanks. You too.